it's clicked over now to 10 o'clock. So this is the first presentation for the MAV MTF bus forum. And I'd, I'd like to welcome Naomi Langdon to the panel and introduce her. Naomi is the Director of On-Road Public Transport Planning at the Department of Transport, which covers bus and tram planning. She has over 16 years experience in transport planning across the public and private sector across Australia and internationally and is passionate about leading user-focused evidence-based change. In particular, she's excited about the impact that improvements to public and active transport can have to the lives of all Victorians. Outside work, she's looking forward to getting back to her favourite pastimes of travel and live music, and I hope that will be very shortly. Thank you so much, Naomi, for joining Thank us today. Us. Thank you very much. Just making the technology work. Does that, can you see that? Yep, it's Fantastic. bright and shining and Excellent. you're loud and clear. Fantastic. Excellent. Well, thank you very, very much for uh, inviting me along today. I'm really delighted to be speaking to you today about Victoria's bus plan. Uh, it's really been a long time in the making and we've developed it based on what we've learned working with people right across the industry and community. So firstly, um, you will be likely very well aware um, of, of the bus uh, system that we've got in place, but I'll give a bit of a background and overview anyway. Um, so it won't come to us as a surprise to you that Victoria's bus network is an essential part of our integrated transport system, and it carries more than 135 million passengers a year pre-COVID. Uh, buses can go where trains can't. So in our growing suburbs and regional centres, buses are really central to local public transport, and they provide another option to a car, and we really provide an essential travel option to those who can't, don't or can't drive. Uh, more than 80% of those living in urban areas across the state are within walking distance or a bus stop. Uh, more than 400 bus routes operate in metropolitan Melbourne and more than 50 regional towns and cities have a local bus network. Now, that 80% uh, number is really interesting. Uh, that's something that we certainly want to uh, improve um, because that means that 20% of people are not living within walking distance of a bus stop. Uh, COVID... Um, has really highlighted the indispensable role of the bus network. So bus patronage levels have remained higher than all of the other public tra transport modes as we've been going through COVID uh, and as the community changed how and when they look, choose to work and live. Um, and this really includes the fact that the bus network forms a really vital service to get our kids to school. And that's probably one of the reasons that it didn't drop as much as the other public transport modes where we're seeing quite a lot of time in there where the bus network was carrying more than the, the rail, the train and tram networks combined. Um, and to run these networks, we've got a huge fleet. We've got over 4,000 buses in our fleet, which is, which is a lot. Uh, it's a lot of buses and a lot of operators um, and a lot of routes across Victoria, all of which play very, very different roles um, within the transport network. So we've got a number of different challenges and opportunities, and these are outlined in our, in our bus plan. Um, so we've got a really large and complex network that reaches a, a large proportion of our population, but many of our bus routes have evolved over the years. Um, so this often means that they don't have a clear purpose or they don't serve a distinct need. Uh, and the network really has become overly complex and we think that really deters potential bus passengers. Uh, We've also got a really, really good, in, good opportunity with the $80 billion big build investment in transport. And that's really gonna transform the way that Victorians travel. So I've got the level crossing program, Northeast Link, uh, including the Doncaster Busway, which we're very excited about, Metro Tunnel, Regional Rail Revival, Suburban Rail Loop. These all present significant opportunities for a modern bus network. And really to leverage the most out of these mainly heavy rail projects, uh, we need to make sure that people can get to the train stations, that people can leverage the opportunities that these new big build programs will give to us um, in a bus network sense. We've also got a really growing population. Uh, so by 2050, um, Melbourne's po projected population of 8 million people will make it Australia's largest city. Uh, and this growth is going to result in an additional 13 million trips on Melbourne's transport network every day. 
And we're also seeing that, you know, with COVID and how uh, seeing how people are shifting, there's a lot of people shifting to some of our regional cities and towns. And that's really changed how people are using the bus network. Um, so really buses are going to need to take an increasingly larger role in supporting the way that Victorians travel in the future. They're our most flexible mode of transport. Uh, they're the mode that can really um, respond the quickest to, to the growth that we're seeing and to the changing growth that we're seeing. We also have a target of net zero emissions by 2050. Um, so under the Climate Change Act, uh, the Victorian government's committed to reaching net zero greenhouse gas by emissions by 2050. The transport sector accounts for approximately 20% of state emissions, and it's growing at the fastest rate of all sectors due to increases in population and associated economic activity. So really to target that, um, one of the key things that we need to target is public transport, both making public transport greener, but also getting more people onto public transport and out of their private vehicles. Uh, so the government's pledged that all new bus purchases will be zero emission buses from 2025 as part of the transport sector pledge. So we're working towards that. Uh, road congestion is a really key challenge for us at the moment. So the vast majority of the bus network operates in shared traffic with other vehicles and it relies on roads operated by different authorities. Um, under different planning rules and different management practices. So that makes it really challenging for us to ensure that buses are really performing in a competitive way. So by upgrading sub suburban ar arterial roads and adding bus lanes, improving signalling and prioritising buses, this can all improve the travel times and reliability of buses. Uh, we also would like to make it easier for people to catch the bus. So how much you need to think about your trip is often higher from buses than other modes because there's no tracks on the ground to make you really certain about where the bus is going, um, unlike the train and tram network. So we can fix this and we are hopefully, you know, moving towards that, but more real-time information and better access to intuitive journey planning tools can help make planning easier. And more onboard information is really going to help passengers know when to press the bell and when to disembark the bus. So I'm really delighted to be able to present uh, Victoria's bus plan to you today. Um, it's a public facing document for the first time ever um, for a, a bus plan. Uh, it's available uh, on the DOT website if you haven't already had a look at it. Um, I'd suggest you do. Uh, we're really proud of this this, um, this plan um, and it's really helping us to uh, start the conversation, um, hence us being here today. Um, I think that's the most valuable thing about it is the fact that we have something there, we can start the conversation and we can move, our, move ourselves forward. So the bus plan sets out how we'll start to deliver a modern, productive, environmentally sustainable bus network that increases the number of people choosing to take bus by delivering simple, safe, reliable and com comfortable journeys. It considers new options that better reflect the travel patterns of passengers, uh, enabling new technology like demand responsive transport, uh, better data and a broader range of buses that are suited to the route that they take and the passengers that they carry. And these changes will all together provide a bus system that's more attractive and useful for all Victorians. So I'll... Uh, outline the aims of our bus plan. So we want to have a bus network that better meets public transport needs and demand. We want network reforms and innovation that make the most of our $80 billion big build and provide a pathway to effective and efficient future investments. Uh, cleaner, smarter fleets with more bus types that best suit the passengers who use them and the routes that they take. Uh, we'll have improved information delivery uh, to passengers to let them know about their real-time services and changes to their services due to network disruptions, a better managed, more efficient and fit for purpose bus network with services that deliver great value for money and improved accessibility and safety. So we've uh, structured our bus plan to meet six key objectives that will help us to transform the bus network and meet the aims that I've just outlined. Um, and as, as I'm running through these, I'll also outline some of the actions we're already taking to move towards the objectives. Um, so the first one is to make the network simpler, faster and more reliable. So we think there's a really great opportunity to make the bus network really meet the needs of Victorians. And one of the ways that we can do this is to make changes to the network so that we provide simple connected journeys for as many people as possible. Uh, you'll see uh, within the bus plan that we've developed new bus network categories that define the role, purpose and function of a route within a network. 
And that'll really allow us to make sure that we've got the right type of route performing the right type of function um, in the right place. So, you know, making sure that when uh, it's a really important key route to get people to a train station or to a key employment area, that that's really considered as a, a, a you know, a connector or a, a you know, a, a high priority route that has long spans and high frequency where, when it's needed versus a route that might be best suited to, you know, smaller buses uh, running through back streets to provide coverage to people. Um, so that really, you know, right vehicle, right route, right span of hours, right frequency um, will make it a much more efficient network. Um, so we've got four categories. We've got rapid routes, which includes bus rapid transit and shuttle routes. For example, some of our university shuttles, uh, connector routes, local routes and school routes. Uh, these reforms are really going to enable us to make better investment decisions and allocate resources where they're needed the most. So we've started with the reform of the night network, um, which uh, has gone live, but hopefully uh, as we come out of our curfew and move back to COVID normal, um, the, all of those services will be uh, restarting. Uh, and we're also planning a reform of the net bus network on the Mornington Peninsula, which will begin later this year. And network reforms will be complemented with new services in growth areas to meet, meet the transport needs of our growing population. So I've just implemented a couple of new routes in Tarnit, uh, and the recent state budget included further services in Tarnit, North, North and in Clyde. So these areas are really critical. We don't want people to be moving into these new growth areas uh, and to become car dependent. Um, so getting services in there as the development's occurring um, is a really important thing. Uh, we'll also trial and test emerging technologies, including demand responsive transport, uh, which will help us to understand how these services fit within and complement the uh, fixed route network. So we've already got some trials up and running, uh, including in Roville, um, and you'll be hearing from Ventura and Move It uh, about that trial a bit more later today, which is great. Uh, and we're looking for further opportunities to implement more trials. We think that there's a lot of um, possibility for DRTs to work quite well in growth areas as, um, as road networks develop. Because part of our challenge often when we're trying to put bus services into growth areas is that the road network isn't always complete. Um, so it means that we might have to change a bus network several times over the first few years of its life, whereas a DRT would be able to respond to some of those changes. So some trials in growth areas, uh, I think, would be a very useful uh, thing to understand. The uh, second item there is to introduce a cleaner, smarter fleet. Uh, so buses that we buy in the future will be safer, more comfortable and easier to access for those with limited uh, mobility. So all of our bus networks will be zero emission from 2020, uh, all of our new bus purchases will be zero emission from 2025. And the $20 million three year ZEB trial will help us to understand the requirements to meet this target. Depot infrastructure and new maintenance capabilities will also be re required to support zero emission buses. Uh, we'll also make, need to make sure that future buses are designed to better meet customer needs, including accessibility and safety. And we'll also need to make sure that we've got the right bus for the right service. So that might include, you know, the use of mini buses and midi buses and also articulated buses where needed. Uh, the third item here is better performing buses. So the more that we can make buses move efficiently and without delays from traffic and congestion, the more attractive they become for existing and new passengers. Uh, we've recently introduced prepaid all board boarding um, on certain routes, and that's really sped up journeys, improved reliability, and provides opportunities for further improvements like rapid running. So we've got a, currently got a rapid running trial on Route 246, which is the Hoddle Street route, uh, and it's saving people up to 15 minutes on their journeys. So essentially what we're doing is saying, well, this route um, is a very frequent route. Um, let's not um, hold the route at timing points along the, the way. Let's see what will happen if we can run it end to end as quickly as possible, knowing that there'll be another bus coming within 10 minutes if it's uh, you know, running at a frequency based rather than a timetable based. And look, it's, it's working very well at the moment and people are uh, reporting they're quite satisfied with that outcome. Now that won't work everywhere, that's only something that would work on high frequency buses, but it's really testing some of these different ways of operating um, to really get the most out of that network. Um, so we'll support the simple and direct network structures with other measures such as bus lanes and priority traffic signals to get buses moving on the roads. 
the fourth item here is to have a better customer experience. So bus services need to be simple to use and to provide competitive journey times. So if we have simple network and route designs, passenger information and stop infrastructure, if they're all working together, that can help to really make buses intuitive for passengers. Better passenger information also helps up travellers understand their options, plan their journey and navigate their trips. Uh, so at the moment we're making more bus, time, bus data, real-time data available to help passengers access the information that they need in the way that they prefer. Uh, and we're also investigating and we'll progressively be providing real-time passenger volumes on buses like we currently do for the train network via the Ride Space online service. Uh, the other thing that we are wanting to improve is better governance and systems management. Uh, so this is really, you know, the back of house um, capacity within government to, to plan, implement and manage bus reform. This is going to be really critical in ensuring that we've got the ability to implement a program of bus system reform. What we're proposing is really, really ambitious uh, and we need to make sure that we can implement it successfully. So we're learning a lot of lessons um, from internationally, from interstate, um, about how to do and how not to do um, bus network reform. Uh, we've seen some really great examples in Auckland uh, where they've been able to implement bus reform, but we've also seen failures where in, in Adelaide, uh, they had a proposed um, Adelaide-wide bus reform, uh, which was all canned um, and, you know, never didn't, didn't take place. So we, we don't want to be in that situation, you want to be in the situation where we've got everyone behind bus reform um, and, you know, to implement it um, in the best way possible to, you know, help as many users as possible. Uh, one of the other key things for us is data. So modernising bus data will put the key performance measures at the disposal of us as planners, as, con as contract managers and operators. And emerging technology is really going to help with some of that, uh, will help to improve scheduling and man management of the bus network and our ability to evaluate performance. Uh, the sixth thing here is delivering better value for money. Uh, so there, there are opportunities to better partner across industry to ensure value for money and continual service improvement under existing and new contracts. Uh, we're taking a holistic view of reform, uh, which will allow us to make sure that we're providing the best value bus network for the state and for bus users. Uh, and we believe that effective coordination, management and processes where possible will leverage that reform investment and will help to provide the highest passenger benefit. So what are we going to do? Uh, so we've got three horizons for our bus plan. So in the next two years to 2023, uh, we'll respond to pressing areas of network reform and on-road performance. Uh, we're going to develop tactical plans and programs and undertake some of the trials that I've already outlined. Uh, we'll also leverage some of the existing government investment we have to deliver simpler and faster bus routes, more reliable journeys and smarter and greener buses, uh, leveraging off the big build. And to prefer, prepare ourselves for reform, we'll develop a bus reform implementation plan, which will set out the pathway to reform under each of those six objectives. Um, and we can't and we don't want to do this alone. Um, and this is where all of you come in. Uh, so we're really seeking a collaborative approach to ensure that the foundations for reform are solid and supported. So we're really wanting to engage right across the industry from operators, manufacturers, right across to local government and other government departments and agencies. So that this next couple of years is going to be really key to make sure that we are delivering something that is fit for purpose, that is visionary, that really helps to, you know, to, to promote bus as the mode the people are choosing to use, so it's not so much of a, an unloved um, third cousin. Uh, so then between 2023 and 2030, uh, we'll start to implement these reforms that transform the bus network and align it with growing demand. Uh, and we'll deliver more attractive networks in high need areas in line with the bus reform implementation plan. And especially these will continue to ensure that we're making the most of our big build opportunities, including the Doncaster Busway and Metro Tunnel project. Uh, and we'll also start to transition to a greener and more flexible fleet, and we'll start to see outcomes from improvement in commercial efficiency and in data and technologies. And then from 2030 and beyond, really that's where we start to support the growth of activity centres, employment clusters and population growth in urban renewal areas and growth areas. And we make the most of longer term investments such as suburban rail loop. 
Uh, the role of bus as mass rapid transit will expand and big build initiatives will come on board online, really requiring network changes to ensure seamless journeys for travellers. So what are our next steps? Uh, so as I've outlined, uh, we're going to be developing this bus reform implementation plan to chart a way forward. Uh, we're in the process of hiring a dedicated team um, to, to uh, push this forward. Uh, we're very excited and thankful to be, you know, have funding available for those resources. Uh, and then we'll be also in touch with further details about how and when we'll be engaged during the development. So one of the first things that we're doing is our comms and engagement plan um, to make sure that we understand when and how we engage um, right across the industry, but particularly with yourselves, uh, to understand what existing challenges are, what your visions are for your municipalities, and what you've heard from people in your areas about um, what could be done to improve buses. Um, so we also encourage you to bring all of your good ideas, innovation and feedback through our usual uh, channels of engagement, our regular meetings, uh, our regular relationships as well. Uh, well. We are working out how best to engage, knowing how many councils there are across Victoria, making sure everyone's heard, um, but also making sure that we can do that in an efficient way. So I think there might be some opportunities to come back to this forum and these groups um, to, to help with some of how we um, manage that engagement. Um, so we're very excited. We think that this is a great opportunity. We've got a very enthusiastic public transport minister. We've got a public facing bus plan. We're really in the best place I think we've been potentially ever to really make some differences to the bus network and the bus system. So we're really excited about upcoming opportunities uh, and we're really looking forward to working with all of you through this process. Uh, and I am now very happy to take some questions. Thank you so much, Naomi. I, I love your enthusiasm and your optimism. I, 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 share, I share those two things and look forward to hosting you at further meetings and working with you collaboratively to realise that goal. Um, we have now time for questions and we'll go until 10.40, which leaves us about 18 minutes. I, I have a question to kick off and then I'll hand over to Jane to field some of the questions that are lining up in our Q&A. We have some 15 questions I can see. Not all will be answered because of time, but we'll do our best to get to most of them and combine those that speak to a common theme. At the, at the first MTF Love Buses Forum, which was a couple of years ago, the Department of Transport announced that it had adopted the strategic goal of 200 million bus passenger trips by 2030. At the time, this goal represented approximately a 70% increase in patronage over 10 years. Could I ask you, what's your current goal in terms of passenger trips by 2030? Uh, so that's something that we're still working through at the moment. Um, we're in a very, very different environment to where we were a few years ago with COVID. Um, so we really need to understand what role the bus um, the bus network can play um, when we're moving into this post-COVID world. Uh, and also, you know, how, how ambitiously can we push for um, additional patronage on the bus network? So we don't have a key target at the moment, um, but I think that's, you know, something that we'll be working through as we work through the next kind of couple of years of of the bus reform implementation plan. Thank you. And there's currently 4,000 or more buses. What are the goals along the way for, for the electric bus fleet? Uh, so we've got a zero emission bus trial at the moment. Uh, it's in process at the moment. Uh, we are, uh, I think the, the first trials will be on the network um, by next year. Um, so that's really exciting. We'll hope to learn a lot from those trials along the way, um, but also develop um, all of the, the inputs that we need to understand how we can transition um, to a zero emission fleet. Um, as you can imagine, there's lots of challenges along the way um, with provision of uh, charging infrastructure, understanding the characteristics of new zero emission buses, uh, which are rapidly improving. Um, if, you, if you'd looked at this five years ago, uh, battery lives were nowhere near as good as they are today. Range wasn't nearly as good as it is today. So we're sort of rapidly coming to the point where a, um, 
a, a zero emission bus can perform in a very similar way to um, current diesel buses. Um, but of course, uh, in a much cleaner, greener, user-friendly um, way. We think that's really going to transform um, places in particular, because rather than having, you know, a few diesel buses idling in a street, uh, you have very silent electric buses, um, which will be much, much nice, uh, much nicer for place making, which we think is really important as well. Yeah, I, I agree. Thank you for answering those questions. I'll now hand over to Jane Wadbock, the question wrangler, to take over until 10.40. Go ahead, Jane. Uh, thank you very much. Now, this is a bigger job than I think I anticipated. I'm going to be <laughs> brief. I'm going to read the question. I'm not going to embellish any more than these words that I'm adding now. Our first question comes from Councillor Bernadette Hume um, from Hume Council. Will these changes be accompanied by a marketing campaign targeting communities, um, providing up-to-date information about buses linking to trains and generally getting people onto the buses? Very much so. So we think that it's a really critical part, and we've learned from uh, Auckland in particular when they've put their bus, when they've done their bus network reform. Comms was an integral part of it, um, and engagement was an integral part of it all the way through. Um, so I think you know there's definite improvements that we can make to passenger information, um, to how people are um, viewing buses. Um, I think a lot of people who are you know, dismissive of the bus network, haven't caught a bus in years and they wouldn't be aware of some of the recent changes and they certainly won't be aware unless we tell them uh, about, the, um, about the future changes, particularly zero emission buses. So I think there's a big part for, um, for marketing, et cetera, as part of this. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, in a related way, um, question from Councillor Claudia Hainel from Horsham Rural City Council. Um, will there be updates on the regional cities' bus routes? You, there's a lot to cover there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so this is a Victoria-wide plan. It's, it's not a Melbourne-only plan. Uh, there's a lot of need uh, in some of our regional cities uh, and towns um, for improved buses. Um, so absolutely, this is, this is a Victoria-wide um, reform piece. Uh, a question from Councillor John Watson at the City of Wodonga. All buses should have Wi-Fi available for passengers into the future. Sorry, more a comment than a question, Naomi. Perhaps you'd like to comment. Yeah, absolutely. And look, that's come up uh, a number of times. I think when we are looking at, you know, getting a brand new fleet of electric buses, uh, there'll be a lot of things that we can look at um, to make people's, um, people's journeys more pleasant. Um, so that's certainly one that comes up a lot. Um, so that's certainly on, on the list of uh, things that we would look at um, when we're purchasing our new fleets. Um, Kathleen Kemp from the City of Port Phillip asks, uh, she says, thanks for acknowledging that some bus routes are based on history rather than current needs. How are you mm -hmm. planning on combining routes that, are cu that currently have different operators to allow simplified, more frequent and more reliable service? Yeah, look, and that's a big challenge for us uh, across Melbourne because we do have so many different operators. Um, so it, it's not as simple as uh, drawing new lines on maps and there you go. Um, there's going to be a lot of negotiating and working with operators. Um, this is It's going to be an ongoing process uh, and how we're going to do this is really the key thing for the next couple of years um, to really work out that bus, that bus reform implementation plan. Um, and operator considerations, of course, will be a really key part of that. This, I think, links into a question from Vincent Ung at the City of Casey. Um, he says, how can we get a better sense of how buses and bus improvements are performing? Is the DOT embarking on any initiative to facilitate open data practices? And you mentioned data being crucial earlier. Mm, um, absolutely. Yeah, and look, I think we've seen a lot of industries um, moving and a lot of municipalities. Um, I know, you know, there's some councils are really fantastic at their open data, um, particularly City of Melbourne. Uh, we've, we uh, use a lot of that open data that comes from pedestrian counts, et cetera. It's really fantastic. Um, I think it's something that DOT is exploring, um, but I probably can't. I'm not the, the, the expert in exactly what's going on. 
Um, but look, I think if we are going to be making all of these improvements and, you know, uh, working with industry um, to, uh, as we go, um, I think, you know, sharing of data is really critical. Um, thank you. Uh, next question is from John Liston, who is at the city of Brimbank. Um, bus journeys account for only 2% of trips in Brimbank, and yet improving bus interchanges at Sunshine and Deer Park stations have so far remained outside the scope of some of the major infrastructure projects in Brimbank. Is there any advice you can give on what can be done to emphasise the importance of the bus network plan's aims and objectives when negotiating with delivery agencies? So that's an interdepartment question that we're all desperate to hear yeah. the answer to. Yeah, look, absolutely. I think having a public facing bus plan is absolutely helping us along the way. Um, these, you know, these are challenging conversations to have um, with major projects who often have limited budgets. Um, but the bus interchange is really often very critical in ensuring that we can provide for future bus networks that can really um, help to maximise the benefits of these big build projects. Um, so, yes, um, it, it's a, look, it's a challenging area. Um, and, and look, I think it's a really important area. And we think that, you know, making sure that buses have, uh, the, the new bus interchanges or, you know, improving bus interchanges in line with some of these major projects is a really good opportunity for us. Um, we've been able to do it in a number of different places already, and it's really been very, very useful for us. Um, to, to be able to make those changes and to also make bus network changes at the same time as well. Um, we had a similar question from Wadi Mati at the city of yeah. Burundara. Um, so yeah. I'm now going to move on to a question from Bhavan Mehta. Um, and Bhavan's asking, what is the benchmark cutoff for development levels in growth areas before a bus route is introduced? Um, particularly um, in... I'll read it. I believe the new routes in Tarnit, Truganin and Williams Landing were introduced when the catchment area for buses was mostly fully populated and the routes were about three to five years too late and only came mm. after significant community push. These services are not frequent and still run on, on or over or close to a 30 minute frequency during peak, mm. um, getting those services um, functioning up and running and improving them. Yeah, absolutely. And I, it's a big challenge for us as well. Often we're dealing with um, road networks that aren't developed yet, as I've noted. Um, but it is challenging for us. Um, we, you know, there's not always enough money to go around um, to, to fund all of these bus networks as early as we would like. Um, but I think, you know, having a, a clear bus plan that notes that that's really important um, any of these things to help us to get um, either from state budget processes or from GAIC uh, is really helpful. Um, at the moment, we don't have set development thresholds that are linked to, to bus network outcomes, um, but perhaps that's something that we should discuss as part of um, our next stage of planning. Um, and next question is from Troy Edwards, um, one of our partners at the MAV, asking, can you speak a bit more about any thinking planning for the interface between the bus plan and emerging needs for community transport, particularly for older Victorians? Yeah, that's really interesting. And it will really need to be something that we do consider um, because there is a key role of the, the bus network is, um, you know, the bus, the bus network does really form a really key, um, key uh, public transport network for those vulnerable users, and we're really very well aware of that. Um, so what we can't just do is, you know, transform our bus network so it, it only targets commuters. That's certainly not something that we want to do. But I think there are a lot of opportunities now um, with um, demand-responsive transport and other you know, new operators coming on board um, and our existing, you know, community transport options. So I think there, there will need to definitely, the thinking is probably, you know, will occur in the next couple of years. We definitely need to, to work through some of these opportunities because, you know, having access to public transport is a really key or, you know, transport in general is a really key um, need for people to become, you know, 
or to become and remain um, within society. So it's a really key social need. So we're very aware, well aware of that. I've got a question from one of our associates asking uh, Yale Wong, is there a move towards operator consolidation and welcoming more competition via an open tender process beyond the 30% MMBF? That's a really interesting one. Uh, and one that's probably not in my direct kind of level of uh, influence, but uh, look, we are looking at everything um, through this, this bus reform. So, you know, making sure that we are getting the most out of our existing and new contracts. There's um, a number of contracts that will be up um, over the next few years um, and making sure that, we're, you know, the state and, and the public are getting the most out of those contracts. So I think different options might be explored. Okay. Um, Councillor Susan Bissinger from uh, the uh, Mornington Peninsula Shire asks, who's going to own the buses? Does each contractor purchase their own fleet? What control does the state government have over this? Are those big questions? Yeah, yeah they are really big questions. And look, we are going to have to have a look at that because uh, at the moment we do, um, you know, operators own, purchase and own the buses. Um, a lot of uh, places in, interstate and internationally are moving towards state-owned fleets when we move towards zero emission buses. Uh, I think that's a lot of the, the trials that are going on now will help to inform some of those discussions. So the shorter answer is not sure yet. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, a personnel question from Richard Smithers at the City of Melbourne. Does Victoria mm -hmm. still have a shortage of signal engineers? Is this a problem for <laughs> buffers? Uh, it's all, it seems to be a constant problem. Um, I know that they are definitely hiring more signal engineers um, through the uh, Smarter Roads program. Uh, but yet, yeah, it's always been a constant challenge um, having and retaining good signal engineers. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to crack that um, because it's a challenge for us um, within DOT as well, you know, implementing changes. Um, I've got a, a question here from uh, Damir Ajik, who is at the City of Mooney Valley. What measures are in place to ensure that the plan is reflected in current upcoming projects? We've kind of touched on this already with the integration, but our current experiences mm. indicate the lack of consistency between outcomes the plan aims to achieve and decisions by operational teams resulting in actual outcomes on the ground, route pairing, reviewing duplicated routes, etc. Mm. Uh, that integration question again, Naomi? Yeah, absolutely. And look, I think having this plan in place means that we can move towards better outcomes in the future. So it probably won't happen immediately, but I think now we've got the framework to work through. Uh, it means that, you know, when we are doing net new network reviews, when we are doing, you know, new plans, new budget bids, etc., cetera, um, we'll be able to have it consistent um, and based on the narrative within the bus plan. So Hopefully, we'll, we'll start to see some really good changes um, in the coming years. We're getting down to, we've only got two minutes left of questions, Naomi, so I'll hey. try and get through as many as we can. We've got one from Ted Teo at the City of Casey. Does the bus plan cover infrastructure improvements to support new bus services? Connecting footpaths, safe pedestrian crossing points remains an issue, and often new stops have been omitted due to the lack of infrastructure funding. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think there's there's certainly a big piece on making sure that, you know, people can actually get to the bus stop safely and accessibly. Um, so I think that's going to be really important. And also looking at what the infrastructure looks like. So what, what's the bus stop of the future going to look like? Uh, what improvements can we make? How do we get more shelters out to places where we need it? How do we get more tactile tiling? How do we make sure that the, you know, pram ramps are there where they, when they need to we work with local government um, to really make sure that we get an integrated outcome where, you know, DOT might be funding a bus stop, but how do we make sure that the footpath works are aligned with that sector as well? So, yeah. Okay, and one last quick question, if I may, Chair. Um, Tiffany Ladovsky from City of Wyndham asks, community transport is sporadic across Victoria and often led and funded by local governments. Will the plan address improved partnership opportunities to close the gap for those who are transport disadvantaged and often reliant on the alternate community transport options, which touches on a question being raised by Simon Stainsby at the City of Moreland as well. 
That's our last yeah, question. Look, I think, yeah, I think that's really interesting and look, something that we're definitely going to need to explore as we move through this because uh, I think there are opportunities outside, you know, the DOT funded and run bus networks to make sure that we're getting the best outcomes for people. So, yeah, I think look, that will certainly have to be something that we consider along the way. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Naomi, for, for answering those questions. Thank you, Jane, for combing through the vast and increasing number of questions. We've whittled it down to 17 remaining, and a lot of the remaining questions are concerned with some of the topics that we've already addressed, including community buses and regional bus rollout. So a lot of interest. Um, so we're, we're, how should we handle those remaining questions, Jane? Uh, what I will do is I will keep a record of them all and I will, if Naomi is agreeable, we will send them to you. It is a long list, um, so we would appreciate the answers as, as soon as you can make them available. I'm sure everyone would love to, to hear what you have to say. Thank you, Naomi. Yep, absolutely. And this will definitely not be the last time you're able to ask questions, give suggestions, etc. So, yeah, absolutely. We'll keep working together. Thank you for that generous offer. Uh, we certainly intend to take you up on that. A lot has changed since MTF Loves Buses 1, and no doubt a lot will change before MTF Loves Buses 3. But in, in the meantime, we, we hope to have you 